rejected. In Babylon, Judaism could be perfectly consistent with the teachings of the Pharisees because the Babylonians were immoral as well. In Christian lands of the West, it became necessary to pretend that many of those teachings did not exist. Even today, religious Jews continue to venerate the Pharisees and their Talmud as the greatest source of light that Judaism will ever know. Yet living in Christian lands, no Jew can fully perform what the Pharisees commanded. This conflict in Jewish responsibility has created a dilemma over the last thousand years from which Jews in the West have not emerged. Yet even before Maimonides came on the scene in the 12th century, another dilemma was being created in Judaism far to the east. This was a dilemma not concerning the doctrines of the Jews, but over who actually was a Jew. In their articles on Khazars, the Jewish encyclopedias tell us that in the 8th century AD, Jewish missionaries ventured north of Babylon to the land of the Khazars between the Caspian and the Black Seas. Khazaria was a vast grassland on what is now the plains of southern Russia, inhabited by a race of merchants, artisans, and warriors of Hunnish Turkish stock. About 740 AD, the king of the Khazars converted to Judaism and made it the state religion. Incredibly, within a few centuries, the people of Khazaria convinced themselves that they were not Gentiles after all, but the physical descendants of Abraham. Thus, by the 10th century AD, a nation of proselyte Jews thrived in what is now central Russia. During the Middle Ages, the fierce Mongols from the east and Russians from the north drove the Khazars west out of their ancient homeland. Most settled in Eastern Europe, especially Poland, where they established communities of artisans and traders. Judaism thus became divided into two basic groups which remain today. The Ashkenazim, which are the Khazars of the East, and the Sephardic Oriental, which are Jews of Spain, Turkey, and lands bordering on the Mediterranean. Today, the Ashkenazim, or Khazars, are the vast majority, about 80% of those who call themselves Jews. The two most recent premiers of Israel illustrate these two racial types. Shimon Peres is a Sephardic Jew from authentic Jewish stock. Yitzhak Shamir, like Menachem Begin, is Ashkenazim, or Khazar in origin. In Poland, these ancestors of most modern Jews thrived. In fact, they actually became more zealous Jews than their theological cousins to the West, the Sephardim. The Khazars were fascinated with that mystical aspect of Judaism called Kabbalah. Kabbalah was the Jewish form of ancient Gnosticism, a belief that God is unconscious yet everywhere revealed in different levels of refinement throughout the universe. Of course, Judaism was always unique among ancient religions in its belief in a single conscious God, a God not only capable of creating the worlds, but of punishing evil and rewarding good. Like Eastern religions, however, the Polish Kabbalists believe that God in his purest form is utterly remote, unknowable, without opinions about right and wrong. Instead, his being filtered down through many gradations, or sephirot, until it reached Israel. Israel, according to the Kabbalah, was the visible, rational emanation of God in this world. Below Israel was confusion and darkness, represented by demons and the chaotic world of the Gentiles. What excited the Khazars was that Kabbalah preached revolution. It said that Jews, as superior beings, were destined to rule the world. In the Zohar, which is the written text of Kabbalistic lore, we find the arrogance and ambition of the ancient Pharisees very much alive. In a typical passage, the Zohar teaches, living soul refers to Israel, who have holy living souls from above and cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth to the other peoples who are not living soul. Only by the overthrow of the Gentiles, the Zohar asserts, can Israel regain its position as God's Shekinah glory on earth. The Zohar calls Gentiles Amalekites, 
In a passage typical of many, the Zohar says they caused the destruction of the temple. So when God reveals himself, they will be wiped off the earth. Redemption will not be complete until Amalek will be exterminated. But once Israel shakes off Gentile dominion and Christian influence, heaven will descend to earth. The Zohar says Israel will fulfill her predestined role, ruling the world under the leadership of her Messiah. Since the Kabbalah, or Zohar, was not merely a theological system, but taught the overthrow of the existing order, it was natural that before long, Jews should begin to put it into practice. With the age of Voltaire and the so-called Enlightenment during the 18th century, we see a host of Jewish Kabbalists migrating west out of Poland and penetrating the very capitals of Europe. Jewish wonder workers, Balshems as they were called, St. Germain, Cagliostro, Frank, Falk, men of vast wealth and mystery came upon the European scene at the end of the 18th century. In Europe, in the years preceding the French Revolution, the foundations were laid for a new order in the world. Kabbalists such as Adam Weishaupt helped establish the ultra-secret Illuminati, which became a cover for plots and intrigues that would begin the erosion of Christian civilization. At the same time, beginning with Jewish philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, many Jews began to perceive their religion not simply as a means of personal salvation, but as a way to reform society at large. Many Jewish activists said that, starting with such revolutionaries as Moses and the prophets, Israel had always had the social objective of righting injustice and taking the part of the downtrodden. It was the duty of every Jew, they said, to come to the aid of the oppressed working masses, called the proletariat, in their historic struggle against capitalistic bondage. Many Jews thus came out of the ghetto and took part in all the great revolutions of the 19th century, including the revolution of 1829 and the revolution of 1848. It is thus not surprising that as the 20th century dawns, we find Jews turning their attentions to the overthrow of one of the last monarchies still opposing Jewish advancement, the Romanov dynasty of Russia. It is well known that the Jews had long hoped to overthrow the Tsar. It was natural then that Jewish philosophers such as Moses Hess and Karl Marx should contrive a philosophy that could make such overthrow possible. It was also natural that international Jewish bankers of New York, London, and Hamburg should finance it. The U.S. State Department, in its three-volume report on the origins of communism in Russia, published in 1931, reveals how Jewish-controlled German banks, under the leadership of Max Warburg, conspired as early as 1914 to send large payments to Lenin, Trotsky, and others in their attempts to bring down the Tsar. As part of this conspiracy, Jacob Schiff, head of the New York Jewish banking house of Kuhn Loeb, invested at least 20 million, which would be close to one billion dollars today, toward the establishment of Bolshevism in Russia. In its article on socialism, the Jewish Encyclopedia, published in 1905, freely admits that Jews in Russia were ripe for revolution. In Russia, it, socialism, has become a movement of the Jewish masses. The later Encyclopedia Judaica tells us the communist movement and ideology played an important part in Jewish life, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, and during and after World War II. The Judaica, in fact, presents an extensive list of the most powerful Jewish leaders of Bolshevism, which included Trotsky, Sverdlov, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Litvinov, Higanovich, and many others. The Judaica also tells us just how many Jews filled the communist ranks. It says anti-Semitism drove the bulk of Russian Jewish youth into the ranks of the Bolshevik regime. When the white Russian patriots heroically attempted to regain their freedom from the Jews, the Judaica says compact Jewish masses were utilized by the Bolsheviks to suppress such counter-revolution. Clearly, Jews and native Russians were engaged in a death struggle over the destiny of Russia. Unfortunately, the Jewish masses won. 
A rare photo shows the First People's Commissariat. From left to right are Yuritsky, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Sverdlov, and Kaganovich, all Jewish. In 1918, intelligence services of the Western powers were buzzing with reports that communism was an international conspiracy fomented by atheistic Jews. British, Dutch, American, and other intelligence reports confirmed that Jews filled the Bolshevik ranks and that as much as 75% of all Soviet commissars were Jewish. In the illustrated Sunday Herald of February 8, 1920, Sir Winston Churchill commented on what had almost become public knowledge. There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism by these international and for the most part atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one.